I'd like to have you turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the third chapter of Revelation where we're finishing up the seven churches. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, as we continue our study in the book of Revelation, the, God, the, the revelation of God to man regarding the end times. And I'll be reading through to the end of the chapter. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and eye salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down on my father with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, we come before you this morning and God, we want to do your will. Father, we want to take heed and warning and advice from this very brief passage this morning. God, we want to learn all that you have for us that we might walk in your eyes as holy and pleasing to you, Father. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fill my mouth and use my words. Let them be glorifying to you. And I pray that the result of this teaching this morning is that every man and every woman and every young person would leave here wanting to be with you, wanting more of you, being more thrilled with the, with the proposition of drawing closer and closer and closer in relationship with you. So take our hearts and we surrender them to you afresh and say, teach us, instruct us, give us the right desires and the right responses. And we want to thank you in advance, giving you glory and honor and praise. And everyone said... Amen. We've covered the six churches so far of the book of Revelation, and we've learned a lot. I've learned a lot, and I hope you have too. Today we're finishing up with the church of Laodicea, and in many ways this, this message is a very, a very hard message uh, that comes from Jesus himself about the condition of the church. And actually, out of all the seven churches, I think this message is probably the most practical and appropriate for the church in the United States because we have become rich and wealthy and fat in many ways, spiritually speaking. We have so much that the temptation is to fall into the very same pattern of the church of Laodicea and thinking that we have need of nothing. And our lives are so spread out and so consumed with so many things that Jesus has taken such a back door to our lives that he is on the outside knocking, trying to get in to the heart of a believer, a man or a woman who has committed themselves to Him and yet has very little true, authentic fellowship with Jesus Christ. And that's the condition of the church of Laodicea. I want to begin by giving you some background and if you're following along in your notes, you can, uh, you can fill in the, the little blanks that you have there. But the church of Laodicea was of course in the city of Laodicea. There, there are several things, just three things that I want to point out that will help clarify and bring more meaning to uh, the words of Jesus later on as we look through this text. The first thing about Laodicea is it's one of the few cities that had absolutely no source of water. They were a city that uh, was built beautiful, magnificent, but they had no water. And anybody that knows anything about city planning, that's like one of the very first things that you've got to look for, is you don't build a city without water. But they had a plan. Heropolis, another city that was about six miles away, did have a lot of water. The only problem was is that Heropolis was known as a place of hot springs. They had no cold water. 
And so Heropolis uh, agreed, made an agreement with Laodicea to, to sell them water rights. They built this long six-mile aqueduct and they piped in this water from Heropolis. When it started at Heropolis, it was, it was piping hot, it was scalding. But by the time that it made its way to Laodicea, it had become lukewarm. Another source of water for the, the church and the people of Laodicea was Colossae. Colossae was about just as far away from, uh, from Laodicea as Heropolis was. But it had icy cold water. I mean, it was just, it's the kind of place that on a really hot day you wanted to go swimming. And, uh, and it was just, it was like drinking just iced tea, ice water, just the, the most wonderful taste. If you've ever been working out or on a very hot day, it's a wonderful feeling to be able to drink some icy cold water. And that's, of course, what was at the, uh, in the area of Colossae. But again, uh, Laodicea had neither of these. So they piped in cold water from, from uh, Colossae. So hot water from Heropolis, cold water from Colossae, in both cases it was lukewarm when it got there. That has a lot of significance for the people. They understood what it was like to drink lukewarm water. I don't know about you, but like when I have my guava juice, I, I don't want warm guava juice out of a can. I want it nice and chilly cold. In fact, on ice is preferable. And so the people there were no different. They knew what it was like to taste something lukewarm and it wasn't very palatable. The second thing about the city of Laodicea that was noteworthy is that they were extremely wealthy. In fact, they were known as the banking center of Asia. Very, very prosperous. In fact, the most prosperous out of the seven cities of the, uh, the churches that we're looking at in Turkey, modern day Turkey. They also were known for their commercial life. They had this, this wool that was glossy black. It was famous all through, all through Asia and Asia Minor. And uh, they, were, they were well known for their textile industry. Their clothes were just fantastic. I mean, you walked into the, into the city of Laodicea and it was like, whoa, everybody was dressed so beautifully because that was like the happening thing there. Everybody was, was dressed nicely. Uh, they were also known for their medicinal uh, 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 practice and their fact that they were so skilled in medicine. And one of the, uh, two of the actual things that they were really well known for was their eye salve. They had a lot of uh, disease back then and one of the problems that uh, was common were eye problems. And they had this salve that they had manufactured that was well known throughout all of Asia Minor as well as an ear salve. And so they were well known for a variety of things. And unfortunately along the way, as they became more and more proficient and more and more skilled and more and more famous, they became more and more self-reliant. In 60 AD, this city had a major earthquake. And we've talked about earthquakes through these seven churches because that whole area of modern-day Turkey has a lot of, a lot of earthquake problems. And, a, and it, it has a history of earthquakes and a lot of tremor problems. And as we studied last week, people would actually flee these cities because they weren't build, uh, built to withstand those types of shakings. And so this church was no different and the city was no different. But unlike all the other cities who, when the rebuilding process began, leaned on Rome for government loans and for uh, you know, FEMA to come in and rescue them, so to speak, this city did it all by itself. It said to Rome, Rome offered help and, and they said, no, we think we can handle this by ourselves. And they did. And they rebuilt in a, in a remarkably short period of time. And the result was is that the whole region looked at them and said, this is a magnificent city that was built even more magnificently the second time than it was the first time. But the result in the hearts of the people in Laodicea was pride, self-reliance. We did it ourselves. We didn't need any of you. We didn't need any support. And pride crept into their hearts. And unfortunately, that same attitude began to permeate the church of Laodicea who felt that they had need of nothing, either from God or from man. Now this message, if you're looking in verse 14 and following along with me in your Bibles, comes from Jesus Christ who identifies himself as the Amen. There, there's, uh, the word Amen means trustworthy. It's, if you look at uh, the Greek text, it means so be it at the end of a prayer. It's like when you say Amen, it's not just like uh, I'm done. It, it's not like I don't know what else to say. I've got to have some way to finish this so everybody else knows we're finished. What it means is, so be it. We're praying in the name of Jesus Christ for His glory, for His purposes. Amen. So be it. We pray that together. But it also means it's the final word. It's like, I am done. It's finished. This prayer is finished. And so Jesus, being the amen, He is the final word of God to man. 
When you find Jesus Christ, you have found everything that you need. That is the end of your search. He is the end of any man or woman's search for peace and contentment and purpose. He is the great I Am. So if you've found Christ, the Bible says that all of the riches and wisdom that could possibly be had are found hidden in Christ Jesus. So if you have Christ, that is the final word in your life. He is all that you need. The great Amen. He also says about himself that he's the faithful and true witness. And again, this goes back to Revelation 1, 5, where he says that he is that faithful witness, faithful to God, but also faithful to those that he's bringing God's word to. Several weeks ago, we talked about the fact that that Jesus is a friend, such a good friend that he actually tells us the truth. Now, we have some people that are enemies of us and they stab us in the back. And as I talked about this several weeks ago, a real friend is a friend that will come and stab you in the front. They'll tell you the truth about your condition. And Jesus says, I am faithful to God and the testimony He's given me to give to you. And I'm truthful. I will tell you the truth in love. What a privilege to have a friend like God, like Jesus Christ, who doesn't leave us in our sin, but tells us the truth about our true condition. And he's going to be speaking the truth to the church of Laodicea. And I hope as I share these words with you that the truth of these words will penetrate our hearts as well. He also says that he's the ruler of God's creation. It just means that he is first. He, has the, he is preeminent in all things, primarily because he's the one that has created all things. We're told by Paul in Colossians that God is, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. It doesn't mean that he was born or created. It means that he has preeminence. He is first among all of God's creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the ruler of all of creation. And he's the ruler of your life. And he was the ruler of the church of Laodicea even though he was removed from his throne by their disobedience. Jesus also says characteristically as he does with all the churches, I know your deeds. I know everything about you. Now with this particular church, like the church of Sardis, he has nothing good to say. That's not a good way to start out your message with Jesus if he's got nothing good to say. And I'm trusting in in this fellowship and in your lives, the Lord has all kinds of good things to say. But maybe there's some things this morning that he'll bring as correctives to you and to me as well. And he begins to talk to the church very directly and he stabs them right in the front. He doesn't pull any punches and he tells them the truth. If you look in verse 15 with me, he says, I know that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Essentially, what Jesus is saying is that they were spiritually lukewarm. This church that uh, was near Hierapolis, that the hot springs there were known for its medicinal purposes. People went there just like they do now. I mean, when you get in a spa after a good workout, there's something about it. I don't know what it is. You just sleep like a baby that night. I love to get in a spa. I don't have one, and, and some of you do, and thank God you do, because I sometimes come over to your house and I use it. Uh, but there's something very powerful about water and, and its healing effect. And so in Heropolis, people came there to, to get their aches and pains soothed by these hot waters. But this church of Laodicea had no spiritual soothing effect on anyone because they were lukewarm. They, they couldn't offer the kind of, of healing that the, the, uh, the, the hot spiritual life of an authentic Christian can offer an unbeliever or a believer for that matter. And neither were they like the church or the, the city of Colossae that had these cool refreshing waters. They couldn't offer a cool drink, spiritually speaking, to someone who was worn out and, and defeated spiritually and struggling in their spiritual life. All they could offer was kind of, well, lukewarm. That was the best they could do. And so Jesus says that they are lukewarm. You know, I, I was thinking of how to illustrate this and there are a variety of ways I guess I could, but I was thinking about temperature. Now, on this island, we have fairly consistent temperatures. It, we don't have uh, 30 below and we generally don't have 100 degree temperatures. We, we really stay right in the 70s or 80s all the time. But after you've lived here for a while, a five five degree temperature difference you can feel after you live here. And so when I get up in the morning, I look out the window and I kind of, is it cloudy or rainy? And, 
And I'm thinking, okay, if it's real rainy and overcast, I wear a little bit warmer clothes. But if it's real sunny, I don't want to dress warmly because I like to be comfortably cool. You know, not too hot, not too cold, just right. And so I look and I, and I think if it's too hot, if it's real sunny out, I don't want to wear hot clothes because I'll be sweating and I definitely don't like to sweat. I'm looking for a comfortable compromise between hot and cold. And that's exactly what happened with the church of Laodicea, is that they didn't want to really be too hot for Christ and, and they didn't really want to be cold either, so they chose a very comfortable middle ground where they wouldn't really be affecting other people, there wouldn't really be any persecution, there wouldn't really be any, any resistance to the work that they were doing. They would just be comfortable. They fit very well into their community, even though it was a, a paganistic community. They, they didn't, they, there wasn't a ripple in the community over this church. Everybody thought, that's a, good, you know, that's a good thing. Everybody should have a little religion in their life. That's the response that the church of Laodicea brought about in the community that they were in. Now, God has a very different opinion of this, obviously. He wasn't too happy with them being spiritually comfortable. And I'll tell you something. He's not too happy about us being spiritually comfortable either. And some of us, on occasion, go through some really difficult things. And, and the thing on our mind is, how do we get out of this problem, right? We're thinking, God, rescue me. You know, deliver me from this problem. And all the while, God sometimes, on occasion, will allow these problems to come to shake our comfort zone and to get us to move into prayer and into dependence on Him and into fuller surrender to the things of God that He might reign and rule and use you for His glory and His majesty and His power and for the building of His kingdom. But sometimes we look at the problems we face and we think it's something that God has to deliver us from as if it's in the way. But frequently I believe that the problems we face are there to create an, an, an anxiety, a, a, a a hopelessness in our own self-reliance and our self-sufficiency and bring us to our knees in dependence on God. Because when we're there, that's where we find the greatest blessing in the Christian life. And so Jesus says, I'm not really too happy about you being hot or cold. And if you look in this passage that we're, uh, we're considering at the latter part of verse 16, he says, I don't like it. I'm not happy about it. In fact, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Now that is a very cleaned up version of what the Greek word spit means. In some of your versions it says to spew, but in the Greek it means to vomit. I don't think I really need to illustrate this. <laughs> it's a very challenging thing to think about Jesus being so distressed and having such a churning stomach over the condition of his church that it causes him to vomit. I mean, as I was thinking about this, even saying it out loud to you is a little discomforting for me to think that God could be so distressed by the condition of his church that he's nauseated. But fortunately, these aren't my words, but they're the words of Jesus Christ himself. I believe that the church in many ways has, in the United States and in some, especially in, in Europe, has gotten so complacent and comfortable in our Christian lives and we just kind of want God, we kind of add God to our lives as the guy that can bless us and see us through difficult times, but not the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, not our master, not our, our champion, not our, our uh, deliverer, not the one that we come to and are living our lives completely for him, not the one who has bought us and paid for us at the cross and, and has the right and the rulership over our lives to tell us to do anything he wants and we have only one response and that's yes, Lord. That is a very uncommon thing to find in the church of the United States today. We've been, become comfortable and we have to be very careful because God says, Jesus himself says, that that kind of a lukewarm, half in and half out Christian life nauseates him. Now, the question is, what are some of the signs of a lukewarm Christian life? Well, I happen to have in my hand the top ten signs for a lukewarm Christian life. These are straight from the home office. I'm going to read these in reverse order. The top ten signs that a Christian is spiritually lukewarm. Number ten, you show up for church once a week and consider it a great sacrifice. Number nine, you only pray at mealtimes and in moments of absolute desperation, a final resort when nothing else has worked. 
Number eight, your idea of tithing is folding up the smallest bill in your wallet and dropping it in the basket. Number seven, you know obeying God is something you should be doing, but, well, sin is just so much more exciting. Number six, you forget your Bible at church and it takes you two weeks to discover it's missing. (laughs) Number five, the angels in heaven have nicknamed you the chameleon for your uncanny ability to blend in with the world. Number four, you consider drinking ungodly movies and swearing okay because, well, it helps you to relate to unbelievers. Number three, these were actually supposed to be a little funny. Uh, Number three, top ten signs of spiritual lukewarmness. Satan and his angels consider you perfectly harmless, maybe even an asset. Number two, you consider your relationship with God extremely private. In fact, it's so private that God doesn't even know about it. (laughs) And the number one sign of spiritual lukewarmness, the last time you were on fire for Christ was when you burned your fingers on the barbecue grill at the last church potluck. (laughs) Top ten signs. Straight from the home office. But we need to be so careful as Christians that we are genuinely on fire for Christ and that we are genuinely seeking to be pursuing Christ. And I'm being somewhat facetious with those top ten signs, but the fact is, is there's some truth in all of those. That God is looking for men and women who are passionate for the things of the kingdom and who are absolutely sold out, nothing held in reserve, nothing held back. The times that we live in require it. The times that we live in are desperate times for the light of Christ to shine more brightly, not to be just a little brighter than the world. So God is looking and Christ is looking for men and women who are on fire for him. Now the really distressing thing about this situation with Laodicea is they didn't see it. They didn't understand. They really thought that they were doing well. We find that in verse 17. He says, you say, he's talking to the church, he says, you say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth and I don't need a thing. This is really their assessment of their lives, spiritually. They thought they were rich. They thought they had become wealthy. And they thought that they didn't need anything from anyone. In Deuteronomy, God is speaking to the people of Israel. And listen to his words. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. He says, Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, His laws, and His decrees that I am giving you, to, giving you this day. He says, Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all that you have is multiplied, boy, it sounds an awful lot like our country. We have everything that we could possibly hope for or imagine We're rich beyond belief. Even if you are a modestly incomed person in this church, in this state, in this nation, you are wealthy. You are in the 95 percentile over the entire world. We are a wealthy people. And listen to God's warning. He says, Beware because your hearts may become proud and you may forget the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He says, be very careful. You know, there's a, there's a great danger to having everything go well in your life. I know a lot of people that, um, if I asked you to raise your hands and, and, and said, who of you could use a raise at work and, and could use another couple thousand dollars a year? I mean, I don't think there'd be anybody here that would say, no, that would really be more than I need. I think most of you would say, man, that would be a blessing. Could we pray for that right now? Are you going to have people stand and come up afterwards for that? Well, no, I'm not. But a lot of people want just a little more. In fact, if you talk to somebody who's fabulously wealthy, you ask them how much is enough and they'll say just a little more. It's never quite enough. The problem is is that we are so rich and so blessed, but it's never enough because our our appetite increases as our wealth increases. And so our appetite is always a little bigger than our wealth and that's why our nation is in such deep credit debt. Not only as a nation, but individually as families. There's a proverb that says, Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. You see, I would encourage you in your financial situation to be content. So many of us would like to have more money, but with more money become more worries, more self-reliance, more self-confidence. If you have a, a padded bank account, 
It's a comforting thing. You pray less. You're less reliant, less dependent, less surrendered. And so if you are kind of on the edge month to month, that is not necessarily a bad thing. That can be a great thing if it causes you to be a man or a woman who just moment by moment is coming to God and depending on your Savior. But the church of Laodicea had such wealth, such riches, that they felt that they really had need of nothing from God or from man. Now, God, through Jesus Christ, has a very different assessment. Look at what he says. But he says, you do not realize they were ignorant, they were blind to this, that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I mean, these are not... These are not the kind of things that this church and this nation could... I'm I'm sure if they heard this, they were offended by these words. How could you say that about us? How could you judge us in that kind of a fashion? Look at us. We're, We're a big church and things are happening here and everyone's dressed beautifully. We have a gorgeous facility here and people are coming and we're well accepted in the community. But Jesus says, no. Spiritually, you may have all these things on the outward going for you, but on the inward... There's something terribly wrong. Do you remember the Beatitudes and Jesus saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the people who acknowledge and recognize their tremendous need for Jesus Christ regardless of the blessing of God and what they have financially or materially. And so Jesus says to them that they are in great, great need. And the question is, how could they have such a major significant difference between their opinion and of themselves and Jesus' opinion of themselves. And it's quite simple. They were using a different standard of measurement than Jesus was using. You see, the church of Laodicea was measuring themselves against themselves. They were measuring themselves against their paganistic carnal community. And they were better than that community. Only a little better. But you see, Jesus was using the standard of holiness and the standards of the kingdom to come as his measurement. And by that measurement, they were falling terribly short of the calling of God for holiness. And as a church and as a nation, we have to be so careful not to take the standard of the people around us and say, well, we're a little bit better. We don't do certain of the things that the world does. But I want to ask you, as you measure your life, are you measuring your life against the holiness of God? Or are you measuring your life against your unbelieving neighbor? Or against the, the people at work who steal and are you know, taking uh, money out of the till or who are dishonest or show up to work later or who are un- unreliable or unfaithful. or Are you just a little bit better than, than an unbeliever who, who sleeps with his neighbor's wife but you look at pornography and, and allow yourself to experience things that are ungodly? You know, are you a, a person who, who you know, isn't a really bad gossip, but you, but you do love to get some titillating information from others and share it with other people. I mean, are you just a little bit, am I just a little better or, or am I measuring my st- myself by the standard and measurement of the holiness and character and likeness of Jesus Christ? And you see, that's the reason the church of Laodicea had no clue because they had become so comfortable and they were measuring themselves by the community at large who was unbelieving that they had actually convinced themselves that they were doing well. This is the greatest danger in the church of America, in the evangelical church, is that we have stopped measuring ourselves against the holiness and standards of Jesus Christ and have taken ourselves and lined ourselves up against an unbelieving world and said, well, we're, we're incrementally better. But of course, as the world gets worse, we get a little worse too. And the world gets worse and we get a little worse. We need to take heed and understand the lesson of the church of Laodicea. Now, Jesus is the most amazing person. If it had been me, this church would have been smoked. It would be, there would be smoke rising from this church. A thunderbolt and an earthquake would have come and it, and it would have finished off that church. But not Jesus. Thank God he's not like me. And I'm sorry to say, but thank God he's probably not like all of us. Instead, he comes to the church with a remedy. This, this, this city, this church that had remedies for everything physical, but didn't know how to remedy their spiritual situation, he comes with a remedy. And look at what he says. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined with fire so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, 
and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Man, he is hitting this church. He is stabbing them right in the chest, right in the front. You see, he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire. You see, this community was, was wealthy beyond belief. They knew about gold refined by fire. And he says, but you've been getting it from the wrong source. He says, I counsel you to come to me. I counsel you to come and acquire from me gold refined by fire. Now we know from 1 Peter, he's talking about faith. He's talking about a genuine faith in God. A faith such that we respond to his initiative. We respond to his call. We do his will at a moment's notice. It doesn't matter what it is. The answer is always, without question, yes to Jesus Christ. So you feel that prompting in your heart of the Spirit speaking, do this or do that or stop doing that and stop doing this and right away, yes, Lord, I will do your will. You see, that's faith. That's obedience. That honors God. And he says he wants us to experience that kind of of, uh, refined spiritual life, a mature, growing spiritual life that we might be all that he has called us to be. It involves faith in God, faith in his word, faith in his promises, And it's manifested in a life of trust and obedience to God and to His Word. And he says, the reason he wants this is so that you can become rich. You see, Jesus, in spite of our condition and where we are spiritually, do you know what Jesus' heart for you is? He wants you to be spiritually rich. He makes no promises anywhere that you're going to be wealthy financially. But he does often bless. And he always meets our needs. But you know what God's real desire is? He wants you to be overflowing, incredibly, beyond belief, rich spiritually. That's his desire for you. But he says you've got to get it from him. It's interesting this word he uses. He says buy, as if we've got anything to give God. Well, of course, he's just using hyperbole. It's an expression to say, you've got to come to me. I am the one that has these kind of riches. In fact, if... uh, If you look in in Scripture, it talks about the fact that Jesus is the only one we can come to. Isaiah 55, 1 through uh, through 2, he says, Come all who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Well, how how do you buy something if you don't have any money? Well, it goes on and it says, Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen and listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. So Jesus is inviting all of us and he's saying if you want to experience true riches then you've got to come to the foot of the cross. You've got to come to the only one who has the true riches is Jesus Christ. If you're looking for fulfillment in money let me encourage you right now to give it up because you will always be disappointed. If you're thinking the next deal is going to make you satisfied or the next house or the next car or the next toy of some sort, I, I'm, I'm, I'm only 40, but I've learned and talked with a lot of people that are twice my age and they've told me again and again that material things do not bring any satisfaction that they're truly looking for. So if you want true wealth, you've got to come to the wellspring of the riches of Jesus Christ. And he says in addition to that, he wants to give us white clothes to wear. Now, again, it's just kind of ironic that this community that was known for its textile industry, it was like the the New York of Turkey, fashion shows all the time, and Jesus is saying, look, the the clothes you're in are are really raggedy. You look like you're a pauper in your spiritual rags, prancing about, thinking that you're somebody, and I'm a little embarrassed for you, frankly. Why don't you come to me, and I will dress you in the finest of white garments? And, of course, he's referring to the righteousness of Christ. That's the only kind of white garment that the Bible ever speaks of. If you try to find your righteousness in anything else, in your good works or your self-efforts, the Bible says that there's only one consequence for that. There's only one result, is that you will be prancing around in filthy, unacceptable, dirty, pauper-like rags. And he says they're unacceptable to him and they will not allow you entrance into the great feast at the end of time. And so Jesus encourages us, come, and he will give us these white raiments, these clothes that are brilliant, the righteousness, the free forgiveness, the reconciliation brought about by Jesus and his death on the cross. And then he says, by Isav. Again, ironic. They were known for their Isav. And he says, you're blind. You who think you can see and who can heal blindness. He says, you need to come to me and get 
spiritual eyes have that you can see. They were spiritually blind, just like the Pharisees. You remember the Pharisees? These are, are, are men that thought they knew everything and they thought they were the, 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 the last word on all spiritual matters. And yet Jesus came to them and said, you are blind guides and those that are being led by you are falling into a pit along with you. And so Jesus says to this church, he wants to take away their blindness. Do you, do you see the, the tenderness and compassion of a, of a God and Savior who sees our desperate condition we have rejected him. We have become lukewarm. We have become complacent and very comfortable in our Christian life. And yet he, he, he says, I've got what you need, but you must come to me. You must surrender your life to me. You must give yourself completely to me. No holds barred. No half in, half out. No partial commitment. No you know, saying a prayer in your early Christian life and then figuring that kind of takes care of you the rest of your life and you'll just kind of kind of skate into heaven? No. You see, Jesus wants the best for you. And I can guarantee you, both from the Word of God, from Scripture, but also from personal experience and years of ministry watching other men and women, if you will dare to live your life fiery hot for Jesus Christ, you will be the richest and most blessed and most content and most joyful person in the kingdom of God. The only reason that the church at times is discontent and lacks joy and lacks fulfillment is that they're looking in the wrong places and they have not yet come to buy from Jesus who is the only one that can offer what every man, every one of you, every man, every woman is deeply longing for. He is the source of all of these things and the source of every good gift. Now he tells us in verse 19 that those that he loves, he rebukes and he disciplines. And he says, so be earnest and repent. Jesus rebukes those that he loves. He's willing to tell us our faults. He's willing to reprove us. And as Proverbs 27 says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Do you see what happens? And we have this happen in our lives too. I've had it happen where people that I know are upset with me or distressed with me or whatever and I know they're, they're probably saying things to other people about me and I just have to put it in God's hands. And then, but when I see them, it's like, oh, but Pastor Bob, it's so good to see you. And, you know, I shake my hand and everything. And yet I know, I know what's really happening in their heart. That's not friendship. But if I have someone that comes up to me and I have as a friend and, and they say, Bob, you know, you've got some green stuff between your teeth. I just thought you should know. Or Bob, you know, there's something about the way that you just addressed that person that you probably weren't aware of, but you really hurt their feelings. Or Bob, there's something about the way that you speak to people that makes us feel kind of like we're junk or we're, we're not worthwhile or, or that we're, we're not doing what you want and we're feeling kind of condemned by you. When a person is willing to risk that, I know I've got a true friend. I don't like hearing those things any more than you like hearing them. I don't mind so much the green thing because I can get rid of that pretty easily. But the other things kind of strike. You know, it's stabbing me in the front and it's painful to hear that I'm not perfect because all of us want to do everything just right, don't we? We want to be perfect and yet we know we're not. And so when a man or a woman has the courage to come and, and address us in that way, it's a gift from God. And you see, Jesus is that kind of friend. He doesn't come and say, oh, you're wonderful and tell the Laodicean church, you're wonderful and then send them to hell or, or let them you know, go into the kingdom of God as though by fire, losing all their reward. No, he comes to them and tells them the truth that they might be rich. And so Jesus is doing the same thing this morning even with us. He's saying, I want you to be rich. I want you to be clothed in white garments that are beautiful in my sight. I want you to be able to see with clarity. I want you to be a light in darkness. I want you to be mighty in the kingdom of God. But in order for that to happen, I have to tell you about what you're really like right now. You're lukewarm. You're nauseating. And you're having no benefit either to the kingdom of God or to the world. And so Jesus tells them the truth and he rebukes those he loves. And he also disciplines them. The Bible makes it clear that he disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone that he accepts as a son. For what purpose? That the righteousness and the peace of God might enter our lives as we experience the benefit of of his correction. He also calls us to repentance, which in this particular passage, it's in the aorist past tense, which means 
It's like, do it now. Don't wait. And my encouragement is the same for you this morning. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you know in your heart you've kind of been playing both sides of the game, that you're not really hot for Christ, that maybe your co-workers don't even know you're a born-again Christian. There are people in your life that you just don't want to, you know, I, I, you know, I'm just a little, I don't want to be too much, you know, I don't want to go overboard. And Jesus is looking for men and women who will go overboard. He's looking for guys and gals that will get out of the boat and take risk for the kingdom of God. And so he calls us to repent and it means don't delay, do it now. Abandon your lukewarm self-sufficiency. I've got to do the same thing as I was preparing this message. It was like, I want to be hot for Christ. I don't want to hold anything back. I don't have that much long, longer to live. At the best, I've got 40 years. That seems like a long time, but it's going to go by just like that. And some of you don't have that long. Maybe I don't have that long. I want to make every moment count for the kingdom of God. The Bible also says that he pursues those he loves. Look in this section, just beautiful. He says, I stand at the door and knock. He stands at the door and he knocks. I remember a a number of years ago I was in seminary and I had gotten in a pretty big fight with my wife Becky and of course it was all my fault. But at the time I thought of course it was her fault. Um, But of course in retrospect it was all my fault. So... But anyway, in the course of this fight, it was like late at night, it was 9 o'clock at night. And I, you, know, you know how marital fights go. It's over absolutely nothing of any consequence or importance. Uh, but we're going at it like it's the end of the world. And so uh, I finally take a breather. I say, I, you know, I kind of get in a huff. And, I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm dressed, I'm ready for bed, you know. I've got, you know, shorts I sleep in and, and a shirt. And, and I'm like ready for bed. So I, I'm, it's a dorm, okay. They're married housing, but it's a dorm. And we live in this hallway and everything. But it's like 11 o'clock at night by this point and I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to walk out on her. So I get out the door and I, I close the door and I walk out and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm just going to wait and see how long it takes before she comes looking for me. Well, all of a sudden I heard this little turn of a lock on the door. <laughs> Man, I got a feisty woman. She seems nice and calm and relaxed, but she's real spunky. So anyway, all of a sudden I hear this lock on the door. And I think, I'm not going to be the first one to start knocking like, you know, like I can't get in my own place, you know. So I'm standing out there for a while and I don't hear anything and all of a sudden I can see the light underneath the door and all of a sudden about 15 minutes later the light goes off and I hear the bedroom door close and I'm thinking, okay, this is really wonderful. At the time I was one of the student leaders on campus, uh, uh, the, the spiritual life coordinator for the campus on uh, so I'm standing outside uh, my own apartment door at, at about 11 o'clock at night uh, locked out and I'm dressed for bed and all of a sudden a, a party of people that are good friends of mine who are my neighbors right across the hall come in and I'm sitting down leaning up against the wall and they say uh, Bob are you okay and I said yes yeah, I'm fine <laughs> just, just spending a little time alone and, uh, and, and they looked at me and they said are you sure you're you know are you sure you're okay and so I finally had to confess that you know my wife and I were in this fight and um so anyway, it was, very, it was very humbling and embarrassing. But there I was at 11 o'clock at night, knocking on the door, the door of my own apartment. And I'm knocking and knocking, and I'm not pounding, and I, but I'm just knocking real gently. And finally, my, my wife comes to the door, doesn't unlock it, doesn't open the door, and says, Who is it? <laughs> the point is, is, that, is that Jesus is really the owner of, of this house that we live in. He's the owner of our lives. And we have oftentimes pushed him right out by our disobedience, our resistance, our our fighting with him over the things that he wants us to do. And he's shut outside the door of our house and he's he's sitting out there and he's waiting. And I, I really think it's instructive that we find that Jesus doesn't say, and I'll huff and I'll puff. And he's not pounding on the door, but it just says that he's knocking. And even this morning... I believe that the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ may be knocking on your heart saying, I really want to come into your life. Yeah, you've received me. You see, this, this passage here is often used as a way of sharing the gospel with somebody, but that's completely out of context. This letter is written to believers, not to unbelievers. Jesus is the outside of this carnal church of Laodicea, knocking, trying to get into his own church. He's the creator of the universe. Do you see the irony in this? He is the one that made the house. 
He is the builder. He is the contractor. He is the one that supplied all the materials. He gave us life. He holds it all together. He pays the mortgage. And yet he's on the outside, gently and quietly knocking and waiting. Something very instructive in this whole thing. And in addition, maybe we can even take a note that if you're trying to help someone who's drifted away from Christ, the, the model of Christ is to knock gently, not to huff and puff, not to threaten, not to cajole, not to badger, not to nag, but to patiently knock and wait. And in God's time, if that person is responsive and as the passage says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, at that point, a man or woman who is responsive to the kingdom of God will open that door and that man or woman will say, forgive me for my arrogance. Forgive me for my foolish pride that would have done such a, an evil, wicked thing to take control of your house, to take control of what belongs to you alone. So Jesus stands at the door and he knocks and he gives us this option to answer. He's a gentleman. He never forces himself on us. And he offers himself in a very beautiful way to anyone who would respond. He said, I will dine with you. This, uh, this concept is, is very important to understand from a Middle Eastern perspective. When you ate uh, the, the, the evening meal with somebody, that was the feast time. And when you ate at that meal, it was a, a beautiful time of fellowship. It was somebody opening their home and their life to you. And in a most remarkable way, though Jesus has been shut out of his own house by the church, yet he's knocking and he's wanting to gain access to your life and to my life. And not only does he come in and, and say, you know, now that I'm here, it's about time you start serving me. No, he puts on the apron and he starts fixing a meal for you when you open the door of your heart to him. And he says, I want you to have a feast. I want you to be blessed. I want to have fellowship with you. I want to love you. Hard to imagine that kind of love, that kind of offer. And yet he offers it to anyone. He offers it to you and he offers it to me. But we have to be willing to say, come in. Take your rightful place as the master of this house. Now Jesus gives some wonderful promises, quite remarkable in verse 21. He says, to the one who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. To those who overcome, who are real winners, to the ones who are stronger than others, to the ones who are more capable than anyone else, to the ones who can persevere to the very end and leave their Christian brothers and sisters behind in the dust? No. How do we overcome as Christians? Is it by our own self-discipline? Is it by our own perseverance? Is it by any of these fleshly, carnal methods? No. Who's, who's given my message away before I'm talking here in the back? It's through Jesus Christ. It's Christ. Listen to what he says. In 1 John, everyone born of God overcomes the world. That's how you overcome. If you're born of God, you are an overcomer. That's what the Bible says. You may experience it more and more in your daily life as you walk in obedience to God and in surrender to His name and to His word. But fundamentally, you are an overcomer by the very nature of your union with Jesus Christ. This is the victory that's overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is how you overcome. If you have believed in Christ, you are an overcomer. That's what the Bible says. Now, if you're an overcomer, what does God promise you? Jesus says that you are going to sit on his throne and rule and reign with him. I, I can't believe this. He is going to let us sit on his throne. I don't know how we're all going to fit, but that's not my problem, that's his problem. The fact is, is that we are all going to reign and rule on his throne with his authority. He is going to give that to those who overcome. What a remarkable treasure to look forward to. And he says, just as he overcame, how did, how did Jesus overcome? He overcame at the cross by dying to self, by willing to give up everything for the kingdom of God, that you might have life and that you might overcome, that you might reign with him and rule with him for eternity. As Jesus overcame, he's given us the ability to overcome and as overcomers, you will rule and reign for eternity with the King of kings and Lord of lords. Not just over the, 
the, during the millennial reign of Christ that we'll be talking about in the weeks ahead, but over the kingdom to come, over the new world, over the new heaven and the new earth, you will rule and reign with him. But he's looking for men and women who are willing to be red hot for Christ. He is seeking the earth. His eyes are scanning the entire globe, even right now, looking for men and women who are willing to put it all on the line, who are not investing partly in the world and partly in the life to come, but they are sinking everything in the kingdom to come. And they are coming to him and buying and acquiring what only God can give. And he gives it freely, but he's knocking and he will not force himself on you or on me. And my encouragement to you today is if God is knocking on your heart, there are just a couple things that you need to do. The first is to repent. I I don't think there's probably a person in here that doesn't need to repent of self-reliance and self-sufficiency at some level. We all need to because we live in a culture that is so decadent and so distant and so far removed from the principles and priorities and ideals of God that we don't even realize how self-sufficient we really have become. So we need to repent of that. And then we need to get right to that door and we need to not say, who is it? But we need to let that person in right away and that person is Jesus Christ. And we need to say, here are the keys to the house. Here's the deed to the house. Here's the, here's the favorite chair of the house. You know, here's the drinking mug of the house. Here's the remote control of the house. You have everything. You are in charge. So we need to surrender that to God. And then finally, we need to let Him take His rightful place in our life as King and Master. There is so much at stake. The Kingdom of God matters so much and the fact is is that God has a plan for you. He has got a design for you that you would live for Him and that you would be rich in His eyes and rich in the Kingdom to come and that you would come into the Kingdom with your arms loaded with fruit of the harvest of Jesus Christ, of men and women who have been influenced by your life because of your passion and your red-hot fire for the Kingdom of God and your love relationship with Christ. Somebody that's lukewarm has nothing to offer anyone. God says that He would rather have us hot or cold, but certainly His preference is that you would be red-hot for Christ. The Bible says don't ever be lacking in zeal, but serve God with spiritual fervor. That's the kind of man or woman that God is calling us to be. And that's the kind of man I want to be. And I pray this morning that you would hold nothing back, but you would be absolutely red hot for God. And that you will experience and receive that word that I'm aiming at, and that I believe I know you well enough as a church to know that you're aiming at too. And that's the reward of the eternal things of God, sitting on the throne of God, and so many other things that we've studied and read about in the first six letters to the churches of modern day Turkey. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning and we give ourselves afresh to you and say, Father, lead on. Make us red hot for Christ and the things of your kingdom. Forgive us. We repent of our self-reliance and our self-sufficiency. And God, help us once again to measure ourselves by your standard and make us red hot, Lord, that we might serve you faithfully, being very salty salt and being very bright light in a dark world, that we might influence others for the kingdom of God. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.